Good evening and welcome everyone. Welcome to Catholic Theological Union to our Spring Shapiro Lecture. I'm Sister Barbara Reed, president of CTU, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to uh, this third of our three annual Shapiro Lectures that are made possible every year by the, by, by the Shapiro Foundation. This, year's, this year and every spring, our third lecture is part of our Perlmuter Conference, and many in the room here today have been part of the conference all day today, and that continues on into tomorrow. Just a little bit of the history of how this all came to be. CTU was founded in 1968 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. And that was the council that issued the extremely important declaration on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions, Nostra Aetate. And so CTU has been very committed to interreligious dialogue from the beginning, especially through our Catholic Jewish studies and Catholic Muslim studies programs. Under the leadership of Father John Polakowski, who is here with us in the room tonight, Along with Rabbi Chaim Perlmuter, these two founding faculty members of CTU founded the Catholic Jewish Studies Program, which became a hallmark of CTU. And we treasure the deep and lasting friendships that have been formed between CTU and our Jewish partners in the last five plus decades. Our annual two-day conference in Jewish Christian Dialogue is named in honor of Rabbi Chaim Gorham Perlmuter, beloved member, member of our faculty from 1968 until his death in 2001. He also served during that time as rabbi at KAM Isaiah Israel. Since 2018, the Perlmuter Conference has been held in partnership with the University of Notre Dame. And we are grateful, especially to Dr. V. Novick uh, for, for this collaboration. In 2001, CTU established a chair in Jewish studies made possible by a most generous gift of Lester and Renee Crown and Patrick and Shirley Ryan. Since 2014, this chair has been held by Dr. Simkovich along with her directorship of the Catholic Jewish Studies Program. And so I invite Dr. Malka Simkovich now to add her words of introduction and to introduce us to tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Barbara, and good evening to all of you. My name is Malka Simkovich, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's Spring Shapiro Lecture. As Sister Barbara noted, this lecture is a uniquely special event that is part of our annual Shapiro Lecture Series, which this year opened with Dr. Karma ben Yochanan's Fall Shapiro Lecture in November, and continued with Dr. Joel Kaminsky's Winter Shapiro Lecture in, Mar in uh, January or February. It's been a long winter. <laughs> it's also the plenary event of our annual Chaim Perlmuter Conference in Jewish Christian Dialogue, a conference dedicated to bringing scholars together from all over the world to share ideas regarding a particular theme. And this year, the theme is ritual in Judaism and Christianity. Our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Michal Bar Asher Siegel, is a scholar of rabbinic Judaism who works on many aspects of Jewish-Christian relations in the ancient world. She is a faculty member at the goldstein Gorin Department of Jewish Thought at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, and she serves there as the Vice President for Global Engagement as well. During the 2022 to 2023 academic year, Dr. Bar Asher Siegel was the Horace Goldsmith Visiting Professor in Judaic Studies at Yale University and in fall 2023, served as Gross Professor for Talmudic Law at Harvard Law School. I could go on and on, but I really have to keep these things short, so you should be grateful to me because the list continues. Her first book is called Early Christian Monastic Literature and the Babylonian Talmud, which won the 2014 Manfred Lautenschläger Award. And her second book is called Jewish Christian Dialogues, on scripture in late antiquity, heretic narratives of the Babylonian Talmud. Dr. Barashar Siegel is a captivating speaker. You will soon find out for yourselves. And I so, the bar is low, don't stress out. It's, <laughs> and I so look forward to learning from her as she shares with us new avenues and new insights into the world of rabbinic literature. 
We will leave aside time for questions at the end, at which time audience members, both in person, and there are many of you on Zoom, can share your questions. But for now, without further ado, please join me in giving a hearty warm welcome to Dr. Bar Asher Siegel. Hello. Good evening. Um, I can't start my talk without um, stopping for a second and saying that me speaking here is not easy for me and my family. Coming here um, um, was difficult, uh, but felt that from all the things that I could do uh, to escape the very hard realities that are happening in Israel, coming here and discussing interreligious dialogues uh, was the place I want to be. So I am grateful for the invitation. Feel very, very honored to be part of this. Um, and um, really feel of all times that uh, what I'm about to tell you um, has real ramification on people's lives. So uh, it feels even more important now. Okay. So uh, what I want to basically uh, do in the next uh, minutes that I have for my talk is show you an experiment. I'm giving you a talk about a project that's just beginning to start, but I think and believe that this is extremely uh, um, uh, fruitful and promising avenue, and I hope you'll agree. So let's begin. So basically, I would like to begin. There we go. So what I do is basically I'm a scholar of rabbinic Judaism and I deal with rabbinic sources and Jewish sources from the first century CE. And my own work look at the interaction between these sources and Christian sources. And I want to try to find that uh, in my own, my, all my research, I want to try and find the interaction between the two and the place they overlap. This project is um, interesting in another dimension because I want to do this using tools taken from the computational side of things. Um, and try to bring new set of tools to look at these questions. So this is what this is about. This is what this talk is about. Um, I don't want to assume any prior knowledge, so I'll say two, two words about the set of texts that I'm dealing with, and this is what we'll, we'll do today. I am a scholar of the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, this is a text that was redacted around the 6th or 7th century CE in modern-day Iran and Iraq. We'll look at the map in a second. Um, but this, the text is very, very important because it became, by the 11th century, the main text that basically dictate Jewish law uh, and praxis. Um, not scholars debate whether it was that way when it was created, but definitely by medieval time, all the way to modern state of Israel and the way people get married and who sits in the back of buses. This is the text that's responsible to how we live our life. Uh, but it's also a snapshot of reality of the first century CE. The reason I chose a few tech, a few pictures to show you that is first to show you the, the magnitude of it. The Babylonian Talmud is very big. Um, this specific set is like very, very big, which is another way to exclude women from holding it because if you ever try to pick one of them, you'll see how hard it is, it's very heavy. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very big set of texts. Uh, but I also wanted to show you that while for centuries this text was uh, uh, studied as a sacred text uh, for men, in recent years, and I'm part of that revolution, women started looking and studying this text. So this is uh, also moving in that sense. Uh, um, I also you know, showed you that I'm, I'm studying this through a philological historical lens, meaning I'm using manuscript and I'm using all kinds of boring changes in the text and, and fun stuff. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what I do for a living. Um, and the question that I, I ask in my books and in my research is, what is this text, the central text that basically kind of like documents the creation of rabbinic Judaism? And again, a very, very important text that became the most important text for Jewish culture. Can it tell me anything about Christianity? and the relationship between Christianity and Judaism in those formative years. The first few centuries of, you know, common era, when Christianity took form, ancient Christianity and rabbinic Judaism took form, can this text tell me anything about contemporaneous Christian ideas and thoughts and praxis and the way Jews 
looked at these parallel Christian communities. Now, the assumption was uh, for a very long time is that no, it doesn't. That would have been a very short lecture. That was the assumption for, me, for, for a very long time. It has a lot to do with the history of the people who studied these texts. When the 19th century critical study of religious texts started, the people who studied ancient Christianity uh, did not care to look at Eastern Christianity in this area at all. Uh, and the people who studied the Babylonian Talmud uh, were very happy with keeping the Talmud separate from Christianity. So everyone lived very happy with that notion. No connection between the Talmud and Christianity. Uh, what happened in the past, I would say, 30, 40 years is that we began to learn much more about Christianity of the area, which I'll show you in a second, and also about the Talmud and what it contained and how to, le to look at it. And guess what? We found out that it does tell us a lot about Christianity. We're just beginning to look at it. I want to be invited to a Shapiro lecture in 10 years from now, and you'll hear much more about that. So we're just beginning our our. Um, kind of like voyage into, into looking into that question, but we're already finding very interesting stuff just to show you where we're looking at geographically. I'm extremely proud of the slide I'm about to show you. Really, seriously, you know, non-proportionally proud because uh, this map didn't exist. And really no one should let me do any maps. I'm awful at navigation and stuff, but I had to create this map myself just to show you that. So this is where the Babylonian Talmud was uh, oh, it's a little bit bright. I don't know if you can see. But there's the Persian Gulf there, down below. And there's two rivers. Can you see the rivers? There's two rivers leading it, the Euphrates and the Tigris, leading into the Persian Gulf. This is modern day Iran and Iraq. This is where the Talmud was created. What I did is basically take all the Christian communities of the time, looking about fourth, fifth, sixth century, and I took a map done by a French scholar in 2010 who created a map and took all the Christian side of the area and put it in blue. This is monasteries and communi Christian communities and put them on a map. By the way, this is not a coincidence that I took a map that was done in 2010. This is Julien, this is a French scholar because the, the study of ancient Christianity of the area lagged way behind. So I had to really, this, this is new stuff. And what I did next is take a map done by a scholar named Oppenheimer on Aaron on, on Oppenheimer and overlap it on the Christian side. And now I'll ask you, in this area where the Babylonian Talmud was created, was there any contact between Jews and Christians? And now give me the default answer of no, while you're looking at this map. Now, isn't, it's like a simple rhetorical move that I just did, right? But the map didn't exist until I created it. And again, no one, no one should drive or use ways according to my maps. Really, I'm awful at maps. But, uh, but, but just to show you that our default assumption should be a different one, just based on this map. Look at, I don't know if you, oh, this is awful. You can't see anything. But uh, uh, I don't know if you can see the names, but there's Mahoza and Ahalda, et cetera. But uh, here, let me jump in. Sorry, I'm back, all you Zoom people. Uh, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a map that really showed that Christians and Jews si lived side by side. Now, should our default assumption be that their texts never interacted, that the people who live there never interacted, or yes, they did, unless proven otherwise, and now let's look for it. Okay, so this is where my research starts. Again, very proud of this slide, and if I might say so myself. Okay, back to us. Now, thank you. Uh, uh, again, awful, awful map in all accuracy and stuff, but just to show the point, right? Now, when we're looking at this, what my books tried to do basically is take, the problem is that the Talmud speaks very rarely openly about the Christianity. That's the reason why people could say that it has nothing to do with Christianity. So you have to know how to look and what to do with it, etc. I'll give you an example today to show. So this is where my research starts, and I try to show in my two books that there are references to Christianity and that the Talmud was in dialogue with Christian sources, with thoughts, with praxis. They argue with it. They were influenced by it. They thought about the same things the same way, sometimes not the same way. Fun stuff. Now, this is my, my work, and this is how I do my work. But at some point, 
I decided to feel that, you know, it took me, I don't know, three years to write a book. And I wrote this book, you know, I have five examples from the Talmud and I show, I think, nicely that there are um, connection between Judaism and Christianity. But then at some point I ask myself, okay, would that lead me to answer the question, did Jews and Christian interact with each other? Because how many examples would convince someone that they did? Is five examples enough? Do we need 10? Do we need 100? Also, if I find examples of polemic behavior, did they only argue? Is the way I'm looking at the sources enough to give me the real picture of it? If you're listening to my question, you understand that I'm slowly, slowly etching and getting to the conclusion that I need actually big data analysis, right? So I need a lot of data to try to answer a bigger question and I can't do it the way I wrote my books. This is where I'm at. So I'm actually gonna show you and try to my project, which is actually using network analysis. This is what I'll show you. By the way, all you humanities people in the room, fear not, I'll be very, very simplistic in my explanation because I know nothing about any of this and knew nothing before I started dealing with it, which is an optimistic sign to all of us that we can actually interact with you know, computer science even though we are scared of it. So just to, to those of you in the room that feel like me, I'll explain everything. But before I explain, I actually want to give an example so you'll know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Jewish-Christian relations. So I took an example from my book. This is my second book, Jewish-Christian Dialogue and Scripture. It's a book that deals with stories about heretics, minim. Heretic walks into a room, argues with a rabbi. I kind of try to solve it and then try to show that they're actually talking about Christian interpretation of Scripture. Highly recommend the book, but back to us. I took, I am going to take an example and show you what I mean when I talk about Jewish Christian interaction. So let's read a story. So the story starts, this is a story that's found in Tractate Chulin. It's about uh, Bijuda the Prince, who's credited for redacting the Mishnah. Um, he lived in the land of Israel at the end of the second century CE. Again, we're reading this in the Babylonian Talmud, which was redacted. 6th century, 7th century CE in a different region altogether, modern day Iran and Iraq. But the story tells us that a heretic comes into a room, argue with him over scripture. The heretic goes away and Rabbi tells him um, an answer. And he says, uh, okay, I wanna give you an answer, but give me three days and I'll be back with an answer because I don't have an answer. This is where we join the story. Surprisingly, Rabbi says to him, okay, take three, three days. And then the story tells us, and it's weird because the question is a simple one to answer and no one knows exactly what's happening there. But then the story tells us, and this is where we join the story, that Rabbi, Rabbi Judah fasted for three days, which is weird. We usually rabbis fast for other reasons. They don't fast as part of an intellectual argument. Don't try it at home, by the way, it doesn't work. But he fasted for three days. Right? And he waited for the other guy to show up. Now the three days are done and he's not back. So the story tells us that he was about to eat, right? He has, he's hungry, hasn't eaten in three days. And you, I can always like imagine him. I don't know if you've been to Tsipori in Israel. We have like one fancy house we think might have been Ravi. No one knows, but you know, it's a fancy house. So why not? So you can imagine like a fancy house is rumored to have been very, very wealthy. So he's about to eat. So I imagine like a I don't know, in America, I don't know, a very Jewishy fancy meal with bagels and I don't know, wax, whatever. He's about to eat. There's a fork. Sorry, can my imagination go that far with American food? But anyway, he takes a fork of food, is about to eat, really, really about to eat. And then <clears throat> someone at the door, I imagine kind of like a butler from like downtown Abbey, kind of a butler. He stands at the door and he's like, <clears throat> and he said to him, uh, the heretic is waiting at the door, right? He's at the very last minute of the three days. The guy shows up. I used to say in the 90th minute until I realized that Americans have no idea what I'm talking about because you guys don't play soccer. So I don't know what's the equivalent of the very last minute of a football game, what a, what a Hail Mary, I don't know what the, the last minute, right? Of the very, very last minute, he's at the door. What would be my sports metaphor for that one? 90th minute, I don't know, the last inning, I don't know. But the last, I'm, I'm not gonna try. So and anyway, so he's at the door, very last minute and he came. So remember, he's very hungry, he hasn't eaten in three days. The fork of food is in his mouth, he's about to eat. 
and they say a heretic. So he's so frustrated. And when rabbis are frustrated, they use verses. So he's like, he's quoting Psalm and he says, oh, they gave me gold for food. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. I'm so hungry. They're giving me poison. They're, you know, giving me, oh, I want to eat and I can't. But then a second heretic walks in. So the heretic that they announce is not the first one. It's a whole, then the, uh, there's a play by Moliere called The Servant of Two Masters. I don't know, Americans do French Moliere, not so much. Okay, so anyway, I had to do it for my SAT, so I remember it very well. So the, the whole thing is based on like one servant and they're confused for a second one and there's a two masters, whatever. That's what's happening here, right? We thought it was the first heretic, but in fact, it's the second one. The second one comes into the door and he walks in jubilant, so happy. The second heretic is walking he's like, yay! My master, good tithing, I say to you, good news. The first one could find no answer. He went up the roof and fell and died. And we're all happy that the first one is. And again, this is an argument over scripture. The guy fasted for three days. He's so hungry. And then the other one couldn't find an answer. Went up the roof, fell, committed suicide. Weird story. I urge you to go to my book and read why it's not weird at all. And in fact, it's a, a very good story. But for my purposes, it's, I want to focus on two things to show connection to Christian literature. The first is they gave me gold for food, the, the, uh, the quote from Psalms, and the second is the term good tithing, good news, okay? This is just, again, to whip your appetite, to go buy my book, but for now, this is for my project, don't forget, we're here for computation tool. What I wanna do basically is take that first example and circle it as a dot. And I wanna look at the verse he's quoting with he's frustrated. So the rabbi is frustrated and he quotes a verse. Now let's talk a little bit about the use of verses in rabbinic literature. So rabbis don't talk about all the verses in the Bible. They just don't. I found that out when I did um, my sabbatical at Yale twice. And every time I go and do my sabbatical at the religious studies department, the divinity school I point out because it's up the hill at Yale, the divinity school asked me to teach a class there as well. Um, intro to rabbinics to divinity students. And I always say yes, and I love these classes. They're wonderful, I love interaction. But the first, the experience, I did it for three times. The experience the first time was very uh, surprising to me. I found out that the Old Testament of my student, the divinity, was not my Old Testament. They knew different parts of the Bible. They knew Jeremiah very well, or Isaiah, which I don't know at all. And they didn't know my Leviticus at all. So we knew different parts of the Bible. And it's the same thing with the rabbis and the patristic fathers. They're, they're, they really, you know, they're, they have favorite verses and they're not the same. You know, the songs that we sing in the synagogue, not the same songs that they sing in church from the Old Testament, right? It's not the same. Same thing with the rabbis. So there's some verses that they, read again and use a lot and interpret a lot and some verses don't care about. Guess which verse they never ever use in the entire rabbinic corpus whatsoever. This one from Psalms, the rabbis don't care about this one. They have nothing to say about this. They never ever quoted the one story in the entire rabbinic corpus. When, when I say entire rabbinic corpus, I mean the entire rabbinic corpus, never ever used instead in it, just in this story, the one story that this verse is picked and used, and it's used funnily, right? The rabbi says, oh, they're giving me vinegar. Oh, and it's funny, right? We all, I saw you, you were all like, you know, laughing, laughing. It was a funny moment, right, in the story. Guess who uses this verse very, very prominently? Obviously, this is a very prominent verse in the fashion narrative of Jesus. This is the verse, basically, that Jesus used when he's on the cross, right before he dies on the cross. Because Jesus says, and John is one example for that. He says, I'm thirsty and a jar of vinegar was standing there and they put a sponge on us. And Jesus says, it is finished, meaning scripture has been fulfilled in him. And scholars think that this is the verse that's, you know, that's used. This is, has, the, I don't know, one of the most central verses in, this is it. So someone basically took this verse that, represent the suffering, right? The moment before the death on the cross and use it humoristically, satirically, not very nicely, by the way, to describe the rabbi's misery, right? They're crucifying me, those Christians, right? When they're walking through the door, right? That's what they're doing basically by pulling this verse, which they never use and doing it kind of like a verse. But for my purpose, I want to basically do a dot. Uh, this is going to be consistent. Rabbis in blue and, and Christian in, in, in green. And I want to, uh, so for me, 
This is a connection, a literary connection between the sources. Someone knew that the Christians are using this verse, takes it and mock it, right? And use it ironically or you know, mockingly and use it. So someone in the rabbinic world knew that the Christians are using it, used it to create its own rabbinic story. So for me as a historian, that moment, that dot, the connection between the dot is an important moment because I just told you now a historical fact. A rabbinic author knew enough about Christianity and the use of verses by Christians at the time to create this story. This is new. We didn't know that, that they knew, that they had any knowledge of Christianity, that they knew enough to create this. I'm stopping here for a second and I wanna throw something else at you. Someone knew and created that story, but someone also understood the story, right? Because they thought it was important enough to keep in the Talmud for us in 2024 in Chicago to read it. So there was an audience to this who knew enough about Christianity. And this is where it gets interesting. How many of the Jews knew about Christianity enough to know this, to understand the joke, right? This is all interesting historical question, but let's take another one. Remember the other guy says, good news. The first one couldn't find an answer. Let's talk about the word good news. Again, philology is super handy here. The word in Hebrew is mevaser tovot. There's besorot tovot, it depends on which manuscript, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but mevaser tovot as a verbal form never ever appears in the entire rabbinic corpus, never. I usually joke that we Jews don't do good news. I stopped joking about that for a while now, but this is, this is what it is, we don't, this, Verbal form never appears in the entire rabbinic corpus. Guess who does do good news or gospels? Evangelion, right? The good news, the gospel of the good news. What's the gospel of the good news? This is from early um, second century, end of first century. The gospel, the good news means the coming back of Jesus. Wait, by the way, how many, I, the first coming back of Jesus was after three days. He announced that he'll be back after three days right? And then he came back after three days in the New Testament. In this story, a Christian heretic says, I'll be back after three days. And then a second one comes in and says, I have the gospels. The guy who said he'll be back after three days, well, he's dead. He's not coming back after three days. That's our good news, right? Someone is taking the word good news, evangelion, which is never ever used. This term is a specific Christian term to refer to someone announcing his coming after three days for the first time and then the final coming, but announcing this and taking it and using it exactly the opposite to mock and say, oh, he'll say he'll be back after three years. In fact, he's not, right? So he's taking this verse. So philology helped me decipher the fact that whoever wrote this story to mock Christian beliefs, again, not very nicely, but for my purposes, I've just proven or proven, tried to prove, or we're doing humanities, we don't prove anything, but I'm claiming that whoever wrote this story was mocking Christianity because they knew enough about Christianity's traditions to take the term evangelion, to take the, the term gospel, good news, use it for the first time ever, to say exactly the opposite while a story. And again, the word Christianity is not mentioned in the story. No one knows that this is about Christianity. You need to know all this background to understand that this is mockery of Christianity. Again, super interesting why it's done, for what purposes, not the point of my talk. My point of my talk is to talk about how do I answer the question? Don't forget, this is where we started. The big question, how representative is this of Jewish Christian interaction in the first century CE in that area? how representative it is of the knowledge of the rabbinic authors, audiences, at that time of what's happening in Christian communities. That's my big question. And this is where I turn to basically quantitative question. How much Christianity of the Talmud is this? I did five stories in my book. It took me a long time to do five stories. And then I did, I don't know, whatever. My first book did with monastic literature of the monks. Another, I don't know how many stories, right? How is it the little that doesn't represent the entire Talmud? Is it, you know, and qualitative, what kind of interaction? This is nasty humor about Christians, right? I just showed you two very, not very nice examples. 
Is this all they do? I'll answer, by the way. No, it's not. My first book is entirely a monastic literature. They love the monks. They copy monastic theology. So if I haven't written my first book, I would have said, yeah, the Jews and Christians can't stand each other. Not true. First book shows in one direction, second book in another direction, but which one is right? So the, the big question, how am I able to answer this in a, in a, you know, a substantial way and not just throw hints at you that this is what I've discovered? So this is where I want to turn into computational tools and quantitative tools. This is what I want to basically do. So I'm, I'm going to use the tools of network analysis. And here I'm going to explain what networks are. So networks are basically a way, a visual way, of representing a lot of information in one snapshot of reality. For example, let's look at a network of roads in the United States. I still remember when I, we came here as PhD students, you used to stop. Some of you might remember that you used to. There was no ways we used to stop at a, uh, every every country we you, every state you would stop at the gas stop and buy those like big books and then someone would sit next to the driver and you know you know follow the maps. I I remember that very well and how often we went we got lost of course. But this is a map of roads of highways in the United States. It's a snapshot of the networks of roads. Look how much information I can get just by looking at this map. I can tell you which roads lead to which, right? So which cities are connected. But I can also tell you where it's more densely populated than where it's less, what cities are a hub where a lot of roads, you know, interact and intersect. I can tell you, you know, which roads are closer to water sources and which are not. There's a lot of information I can glean just by looking at this map. Also, you can kind of guess, you know, is America very populated, not very, this is, this is, this is, it has, has a lot of information just by a snapshot. So this is a network, but we can also use this to talk about much more information. So this is a very famous map by a scholar nerd Barabasi, and he did this in uh, 2004, and he took basically a blogosphere, a political blogosphere, and, and uh, put dots for people who talk to each other, who talks to whom. This is a Republican and Democrat, but he's talking to them. This is a political, and you can see who's in the center, who talks to who, who is in the side. This is a very famous, look how much data he can just represent by, by looking at uh, a, a network analysis of it. So using that, the project that I'm telling you about, which I'm, uh, I'll, I'll share with you in a second, is basically trying to understand, I don't go small, I go big in this one. And I basically try to understand the big question of Jewish, Christian, the interaction and knowledge of Christianity in the Babylonian Talmud. That's this project. So how do we do this? So the first is I need data, right? So my book, again, a few examples, not represents, how do I collect more data? And I need a lot of data to create a network, right? This is not enough, what I just did. Second, I need to network analyze that data. And thirdly, I need to interpret the results. Well, then we'll go slowly and I'll show you how it's done and I show you preliminary results. So it's the first one, collection of all previously discovered connection. This is the easy part, there's not a lot. There has been much more in recent years with Danny Boyarin and Peter Schaefer and Jeff Rubinstein and uh, Holger Zellenten. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a part of a very small but distinguished group of scholars who do this. And we look at Jews and Christians in the Talmud so we collect all the work and all the examples, and I have a, a, a student who, you know, maps them and do dots of literary connection, right? What information about Christianity I can find. But in fact, I can use NLP, natural language processing. No one gets scared. I'll explain in a second what that means. I can use computers to find many, many more examples very fast. And lastly, categorizing what I found. When, when I say using a computer to find an example, um, you all know what I'm talking about because you all use a search engine called Google. When you look for something in Google, you will not only get the results of what you're looking for, you'll get results for other stuff too. So for example, if you're looking for queen, by the way, I wrote this after the queen uh, died, so that was uh, what was in my mind, you might find in Google um, examples that you know, will have king also, and you'll find stuff that has woman or royalty or palace. You'll find other examples that are a group of what we call distant reading. So you have a group of words that go along with the word queen. So you'll find other examples. So for example, if I look at the Talmud and I try to say, okay, go for it. 
try to find you find the Talmud and you put in front of it, you know, and next to it, Christian text, go for it. And the computer can find me parallels, even if they're not exact parallels. Because what I did, by the way, in my own book, so for example, I worked on a parallels on something that has to do with chalitza, taking off one's shoes as part of a divorce, not really divorce, but some kind of a, can go into all the details of that, but whatever, uh, those of you who know what I'm talking about, I had to find whatever parallels between that and Christian literature. So I had to go and look for shoe, when you take off the shoe in the ceremony. So you take, I, I had to go for shoe and sandal and footwear. And I had to, you know, I had to go through and look for the words and find the parallels in search engines, which by the way is already an advancement because, you know, I couldn't do this work without search engine in Christian literature, but I, you know, I could do that, but I had to look for all the words and also in Greek and in Latin and in Syriac. And I had to go through this computer now can do this on its own because it can look for all those words without me having to go through the search and, and look for everything. So that actually makes it. So there's gonna be a lot of data that is not real parallels, but at least we're advancing much faster than we would by using Michal and her search engines, right? So this is a huge development and all the technology is already in place. We have the search engines, we can do this. Not only that, the fact that we have Google as search engines, like we can actually use um, translations and not just the original languages. And I can use old, old translation that use, you know, fancy King James Bible kind of wordy and like new, because once we do this like distant reading, it doesn't have to be the same word, right? So we can, we can do this and it's already there. I want to show you uh, by introducing you to my friend, Yossi Ovel. This is where I have to uh, uh, insert bats into the picture. Uh, in, in a second, I'll explain. But basically what I want to show you is I did that. I took examples from my book, not, not done by NLP, but by hand, what I do in my book. And I wanted to show the potential of such a method, right? So I'll, I took all the examples in one of the chapter, chapters of my book, and I created a network. Again, this is a very small scale example, but um, for this, I turn to my friend Yossi Ovel. So Yossi Ovel is the head of the Sego School for Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University, and he's a scholar of bats. And the reason that we work together is because we were both uh, members of the Young Academy of Scientists in Israel, and we became friendly, and we, uh, uh, he's very funny, and we have the same sense of humor, so that worked. Uh, and then COVID hit. And we were talking to each other and he said, you know, we're all home and, and, and looking. And he said, can I join your class on Jewish Christian? And I said, yes. And I obviously made my kids listen to all his bats talk. At that point, I don't even know if you remember, we were all looking for, you know, stuff to do with our kids. So my kids learned a lot about bats that year because of Yossi. But Yossi joined my class. And at some point he says to me, by the way, you should do the map. That was Yossi's ideas. I, need, I give him always credit for that. And he also said, let's do network analysis. And why? Because he does network analysis with his bats. Let's look at this map here, which we can't see because it's too far. But Yossi does network analysis for his bats. What does he do? Yossi has... Um, Moshava, help me out, Zvi. Uh, colony, colony of... Uh, so he's not helping at all with Hebrew and with English today. So I have a colony of bats in Tel Aviv University. And uh, what's unique about his colony of bats is that they're free to come and go as they free. This is the first time he's done, and he's able to watch them very carefully. He has a, a you know, a, a cameras you can actually log on and see his bats and they go in and out and he can do all kinds of research on them. Uh, and in this study, he asked the question, is there a connection between um, sexual intercourse between the bats and food. So would a bat uh, who gives, uh, a male bat who gives food to a female bat uh, would more likely get uh, sex from her that night, right? So would, would that work? Would sex, sex for food kind of research? Doesn't matter. It's very cool actually. But look at his, so he, he has, he mapped his bats. There's so the, 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 the more um, uh, bright one, the, the, the um, not the dark, circle, but, but the whitish uh, um, squares are female bats and the uh, more darker squares are male bats. And you can see who's connected to who, right? And what direction that the, who, who gave food and who got intersect, you know, in, uh, uh, 
uh, sexual interaction uh, that night, and you can see who, who's connected to who, right? And you can see Ahab, who's very, you know, very, very interesting research, but look how much you can learn from this, like, one snapshot, right? You can really answer a good question. Do, do bats do that or not? And who does it and in what way? And you have all the names of the bats, by the way. I don't know if you can say one is four points. Um, by the way, my kids got to name bats that uh, um, uh, COVID year. That was very exciting. I, I was very... Uh, famous with my kids from then on, uh, uh, but this is you know this is this is a bad. So Yossi says, let's do that for your Talmud. By the way, this is uh, I'm adding something to you. I was thinking uh, this morning uh, that we're doing the solar eclipse, and I asked uh, uh, Yossi, does bats act weirdly on solar eclipse? And that's what we found out that they don't. That's just so you know. Because I thought that would would work well if we're talking about bats already. Just so you know, they checked and they don't act weirdly on uh, solar eclipse. So. We learned something about bats today. Okay, back to us. What Yossi and I did is basically try to show the importance of network analysis of the, the sources that I find. So this, this is the first network that we created. By the way, so we met once a week for two hours every week, and it took us, it looks very, very simple. You don't know how much work went into that. It was incredibly difficult to work with someone who's used to saying a dot is a male bot, bat and a dot is a female bat and that there's a line because if they had if they gave him food or not. Now, what's your dot, he asks me. And I'm like, what do you mean? I wrote 30 pages about that dot. He said, do they know this is source? Do they not know the source? And it was very, very difficult to bridge the gap between exact sciences and humanities. It was very painful. Um, to the point of, you know, uh, we, we remain very close friends, but it took work on that one because it was very, very hard to create. But this is the final result. What we did is we took the Hulin, this is the green one in the middle, and we basically connected it to all the tradition that we can find. You can find the Evangelion one, the gospel, right, you see? But gospels in two meanings, both the book itself and the good news. So this is two one. You can see the time, there's a timeline around, right? So if the tradition appears late, you, you start, here, uh, I don't know if you can see my hand. You start uh, down below and you go all the way to the top to the, si to the sixth century, beginning of the sixth century. Why? Because there are some references to the Holy Spirit that did not appear before the fourth and the fifth century, comma, the Talmud purportedly talks about a, a sage that lived in the second century, but shows evidence of Christian knowledge of tradition that could not appear before the fourth and the fifth century. So super interesting for the dating of the Talmud finishing whoever got that, got that, and if not, not, but that has a lot of ramification for dating. But just so you, you see, now also I could use the, 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 the thickness of the line. How sure am I of the connection, right? How sure am I that they knew, right? So I could play around with that as well. Um, also, if you see the dots in the blue, change color, because I also map them geographically. The lighter it is, the more to the west it is. Right, so all the way to Embryos, who sits in Rome, but starts with, I don't know, uh, Matthew that I put in the area of the land of Israel. Debatable, but at least, you know, more west than the others, right? So you can, you can see also the geographical spread. What I did also, which was fun, is that in one case, I actually took another Talmudic source and said, if both know that same Christian tradition, maybe now I can talk about inter. Talmudic passages, if they both know a Christian tradition, maybe they know each other. So we can do a lot of fun stuff. Fine, this is the gen. But then I took the same information and sliced it differently. And we did that. We put it on an X and Y um, seal, um, Xs. The geography is down below and the timeline is up there, right? And we're, and we're, I'm, I'm only timelining the Christian sources, not the rabbinic sources. Uh, same thing, you can see the geography, right? The, the, the dots lead off with the sources are in the, in the area of the land of Israel, the Ati Ambrose and, and Rome, fine. In this source though, what I did is that I took the line connecting them and colored in red polemical. We just read two examples where they mock Christians and in black when it's not polemical. It just shows evidence of the tradition. And this is where it starts gets interesting. Because I, who wrote the book, this chapter, hadn't noticed 
that the later the tradition, the less polemical it is. The Talmud argues with tradition from the New Testament and shows evidence of later patristic writing without arguing with it. I'm telling you, I wrote the chapter and hadn't noticed it until I sliced it in dots and lines. Let's do some one more that I found out when I did it this way. I also noticed, I don't know if you noticed, that the later the source, the more widespread it is geographically. So the Talmud, the more it advanced, it knows more sources going all the way to the West. Now, can I tell you now that the Talmud argues with the New Testament, but is totally fine with patristic writing? No, I cannot. I only checked, I don't know, whatever, eight, 10 examples. It, it means absolutely nothing. This is small scale, but that's interesting, isn't it? It's a question worth asking. When the Talmud knows Christianity, what Christianity do they know? Do they only know Christianity from the Eastern side of the border? Syriac Christianity? Or do they also know Western Christian, Latin Christianity? What's the answer? I don't know. I haven't done the research yet. But it's interesting to ask, right? And I, and I promise you, I didn't ask until I put this in dots and lines. And I needed much more information and much more data to do it. Now, we were fortunate enough to have our uh, research uh, published in Nature Humanities a few months ago. We're very happy about this. It took a long time to convince them that this is worth publishing uh, because it's Talmud. Literally, we got asked about why is this interesting? Not that the method is not good. Um, but this is the first time they published anything that has to do with this. And it was hard to find something because it's so interdisciplinary to try to convince. But Honestly, I'm telling you, as a scholar, I got very, very excited when I, who knows the material, understood the merits of taking a 200-page book and putting it into dots and lines. Because you look at the difference, you right? take a step back, it's very hard, and it's extremely simplistic. I got yelled at for putting, you know, the New Testament in the area of the, the land of Israel. And I got yelled at for like, you know, claiming that they knew something just because they're, it's very simplistic. It, 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 it does something very crudely by putting it into dots and lines. And again, I'm not giving up on the 200 page book. I'm writing a third one as we speak. But I argue that putting also it crudely in dots and lines is important too, because it can really lead us to new questions. And that's exactly what I want to do. I'm skipping that one. That's monastic literature, literature of the monks and the Talmud. And I use here an algorithm from Google. Not going to explain it, so don't worry. Uh, but this is extremely important too, which is a hub. What kind of stuff from the monks do the Talmud know? Just whetting your appetite. But what's more important for me is that if I take these results and interpret it on real life people, who created these traditions, what can I say about them now? What did they know about Christianity? What did they care about? What did they argue with? What did they borrow from the Christian? What did they thought was worthwhile and what not? These are, you know, the, the potential of understanding that question on a large scale is incredible. So I'm just throwing out there a few of the questions that I've had while working on it. What's the connection between the author? What's the distribution of the interaction? How many are polemics and how many of them are accepting? How much did they borrow from the question and how much did they argue with? Do they mock more or do they accept more? I don't know the answer to that. What's the level of connectedness? Do they know like the Augustine 3.2 in his confession, that's what they know? Or do they know the central part of Matthew, Sermon of the... What, what, what parts do they know of Christianity? Do they know the known parts? Do they know the, the more obscure parts? I don't know the answer to that. And most importantly, I don't know what I don't know. Until I, until I sliced the data in a certain way, I didn't even know to ask the question about the distribution in time, the connection between time and polemics. I didn't know until I saw the pattern when I sliced it. What do I don't know? And that's why it gets interesting. So the idea of the project, and I'm finishing, I know, I know I'm out of time, is to take a map like that and to do many, many network analysis and basically map the entire Talmud using computational tools. And the idea is basically to take the Talmud and ancient Christianity, use scholarships such as myself, and I gave an example of my colleagues, Tobias Nicholas from Regensburg, but any other scholar, 
use network analysis to go back into the research and better understand what we're trying to claim. That's the, the, that's the idea of the project. Um, the impact is basically is to present the complete bird eye view of Jewish Christian interaction, which we weren't able to do using methods what we haven't done before from the digital humanities network and literary interaction. And side point, I want to say something else. Rabbinics is often neglected as part of the larger study of religious studies. It's put aside in, in religious studies department and programs. And this project kind of brings it back into the study of religious studies as a whole. The connection between Judaism and Christianity is part of the connection between religious groups in the ancient world and should be studied as part of that. Lastly, I want to thank you all for listening to this new project. I am aware that this is new, and I said a lot that I don't know. I hope you'll forgive me for that, but I'm being very honest. But I do believe that it has a potential to bring in tools uh, from other methods and other ways, bat scholars and others, to bring and help us better understand our sources. We shouldn't be afraid of collaborating with other resources and, you know, step out of our comfort zone, still write our boring, long-winded articles, yes, but still use other technologies to do it better and to ask and seek new ways of understanding the material. And again, lastly, in this time and age, when religious interaction between different groups is actually putting people's life at risk, actually killing, actually tearing families and nations apart. There's no better time to focus our attention and learning from the past about how religious community interacted in the past and how we can learn to do it better. Um, and I really think this is a sacred duty that we all should do, and especially now. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.